There's nothing more inspiring than coming face to face with people fighting to have their voices heard. In order to get the true story from those involved, you have to spend time getting to know the people themselves, hanging out. We're chasing down the human story, whatever it is. Some of the best stories are the ones about empowerment. The bigger the obstacles, the better the story. To give a voice to the disenfranchised, the ones on the fringe, I have to say, it's powerful. See me down the street, but you can't get close because I'm much too fast and I'm much too loud. And I'm so caught up. Is it me or my luck you get it? Every time Sao Paulo, Brazil hosts its annual gay pride parade, millions of people arrive to walk the 2.6 mile route. It's the biggest gathering of gay, lesbian, and transgender people in history. The event is strongly supported by the Brazilian and local governments. Politicians ride the floats, and there are over 2,000 police on hand to patrol the festivities. And yet Brazil, sadly, is the trans murder capital of the world. More transgender people are victims of violence there than any place on Earth. At the same time, it's worth noting that Brazil recently elected its first transgendered government official in Rio de Janeiro. I wanted to tell a positive story about the complicated relationship between the growing transgender community and the rise of transphobia taking a hold in Brazil. To do that, I needed somebody who not only overcame obstacles in her own identity, but found a way to share her unique beauty both outside and in. And this is Brazil's Trans Awakening. Hey guys, it's Carmen Carrera, and I'm an actress and elite model from New York City, USA. I'm here in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I'm really looking forward to this journey. I was assigned male at birth. I went through my transition from male to female, and I'm a transgender woman. I am on Avenida Paulista, which is one of Sao Paulo's most iconic avenues. Tonight, the streets are filled with cars, but tomorrow the streets will be filled with hundreds and thousands of people celebrating their pride and fighting transphobia. Brazil is the largest country in the Southern Hemisphere, and with over 200 million people, it's home to the biggest population in all of Latin America. The country was ruled by a right-wing military dictatorship until the late 80s, has strong Catholic roots, and has seen a booming evangelical movement in recent years. So there's a strong conservative side to Brazilian society. At the same time, Brazil is a global leader in promoting LGBTQ rights, passing a number of equality laws, including legalizing same-sex marriages in 2013. Compared to many of its neighbors, Brazil would seem to be a haven of acceptance. But this is a complicated place, and there's been an alarming spike in the number of crimes specifically targeting the trans community. Sao Paulo's Gay Pride Parade is the biggest in the world, drawing two and a half million people each year. Confetti and kisses decorate the streets in what has been called a defining moment for Brazil's LGBTQ movement. Melissa Paixão is a model and a prominent advocate for LGBT rights. She's come to share her insight on how far Brazil has come and how far it still has to go. You are exceptionally 
um, successful here in Brazil, just how you've been able to succeed in a place that trans women like us have a very difficult life. Aqui no Brasil, nós somos muito julgadas o tempo todo. Já tem jargões que é, toda trans tem que ser prostituta, a gente é vista dessa forma. Infelizmente, no Brasil é assim. Por exemplo, já deixei de fazer trabalhos porque não me aprovaram por eu ser trans. Isso acontece. O Brasil é um país um pouco atrasado nessa questão de aceitação de trans no mercado de trabalho. Graças a Deus, tenho feito muitos trabalhos de moda, de, como modelo mesmo. Atuo muito para amigos, já tenho alguns trabalhos sempre assim fechados todo mês. Então, isso é muito legal. For most trans women who don't have passing privilege, life is way more difficult. They end up prostituting. How how is your life that you know that you're not so masculine that you do blend? Is it harder or easier? Eu já conquistei os meus documentos, os meus registros, eu já alterei o meu nome. E no Brasil, onde eu vivo, com certeza eu passar batido, pelo menos no dia a dia, isso me ajuda muito. The concept of passing privilege or being passable is important in the trans community. It refers to those who can pass as the gender they identify with, meaning they have an easier time navigating mainstream society and avoiding harassment and discrimination. When you're transgender, they're just like, where? Where? Where's the transgender? Olham pro pescoço para ver se tem um pomo de Adão ali. Yeah. In my opinion, to help is to remain visible, because if we make it a normal thing, we are going to open ourselves up to the ignorance. And I think that that's part of helping as well. Brazil has the world's highest murder rate of transgender people. The numbers are jaw-dropping. Between 2008 and 2016, there were over 2,100 reported killings of trans and gender diverse people worldwide. 845 of those were in Brazil, making it the most dangerous country in the world for transsexual and transgender people. And the stigma against trans people in regular life has wide-reaching effects. According to statistics, 90% of trans women in Brazil are involved in some form of sex work. Parece que é uma gaiola fechada. Um, emprego não tem, só discriminação. É humilhação, é xingamentos. Quando se passa do verbal, vai para o físico. Porque uns não aceita. Fazer programa não é fácil, a gente é violentada. Dois rapazes já me agrediram, tiraram sangue de mim, me bateram. So, do you think that you were targeted because you were trans, you and your friend? Sim. Eu tive amigas que foram assassinadas na rua. Levaram o tiro. Esses dias aconteceu aqui uma amiga minha, tava bem aqui, aí o rapaz foi, estraçalhou a cabeça dela, ficou pisando em cima da cabeça dela, de baixo e se meteu. Muitas coisas acontecem. Mas já aconteceu alguma coisa contigo? Uhum. Aconteceu? Três facadas. Só que tava tudo bem. A parada gay, coisa mais linda do mundo, mas aquilo é tudo um espelho para passar para vocês lá fora. A realidade que a gente vive aqui é outra. Por ser negra, pobre e transexual, é pesado. I never thought about myself as privileged until I came here. And I realized how much privilege passing has. A intolerância no Brasil, ela é uma das marcas da nossa cultura, embora tudo isso tenha ficado muito nos subterrâneos da sociedade. As políticas públicas de São Paulo são realmente avançadas. Nós estamos tirando essas pessoas voluntariamente da rua e oferecendo uma bolsa de estudos para que essas pessoas, num ambiente controlado, possam repensar suas trajetórias de vida a partir desse ponto de apoio. Com apenas um ano de programa, Nós já temos travestis prestando o nosso exame nacional para ingresso na universidade, por exemplo. For a young trans, trying to find their identity within the confines of family and society can be a delicate dance. Today we're meeting Sofia. She's a young trans woman in flux. 
she still lives at home with her parents because she's having difficulty finding a job based on the way that she looks. Sophia's family is in the dark about her true identity. At home, she goes by her birth name, Lucas. Young trans men and women often face severe repercussions for coming out, like being disowned or kicked out of the house. You're so close to your brother. Like, does he know like details of your life? Às vezes eu sinto que eu tenho uma uma dupla personalidade que em casa, na família, eu me comporto de determinada forma para poder agradar as pessoas que me vêm aqui. Do you feel safe? Eu não me sinto totalmente segura aqui. Então, como é viver num país que a qualquer momento você pode ser morta? I think that you have to have a serious conversation with your family and tell them the statistics because this is Brazil, this is where it happens. I think they'll get over it really quickly if you tell them, like, listen, I can get murdered out there. Would you like me to get murdered out there? Would you like me to get killed? Or would you like to take care of your kid? Because you know why? It's your parents' job to love you. The lack of resources available to the trans community has led to many soliciting information from other trans people about the best ways to self-medicate, obtaining hormones and other drugs without proper medical supervision. While this is dangerous, it may be the only option for those that want to keep it hidden from their families. Ficou outra pessoa. <laughs> Feel more comfortable? Yes, Fico. Yeah. I've had to pull myself out of so many lows. In the beginning of my transition, I remember I was self-medicating. I remember how insecure I was. I remember how I wouldn't leave my house unless I looked like the perfect woman. No grupo de teatro que eu faço parte, todas as pessoas de alguma maneira me abraçaram e me entenderam, porque foi ali que eu contei a primeira vez sobre me sentir enquanto uma pessoa trans. Eu devo muito a, a eles. Being trans and just existing amongst society, it is a 24-hour, seven days a week responsibility. O que eu busco com a minha transição é mais uma expressão de gênero que seja livre. <laughs> There's so much power and pride that I feel like that same power and pride should be applied towards creating a safer environment for our community in Brazil. It's truly inspiring with the women here in Brazil is how hopeful they still are given the reality of their lives. Yeah. That they're willing to risk their lives to be who they are. For centuries, the Aymara people of Bolivia have clashed with conquerors and invading forces from Europe and elsewhere. These people have lived in the Andes Mountains of South America for hundreds of years and they're known for their colorful clothing, fancy headgear, and a fierce independence. As the colonial city of La Paz, the capital of Bolivia, has crept outward, an entirely new city has formed, an Aymara city. El Alto is the highest city in the world at over 13,000 feet. I went there to tell the story of a community asserting its identity using, of all things, architecture. Check out Cholets. Think Bolivia and what images come to mind? Llamas, women wearing bowler hats, cities high in the mountains. Tucked away mostly high up in the central Andes, it remains one of the more mysterious countries in Latin America. Then there's the altitude sickness, which many get to know well upon landing at the capital La Paz. Luckily, the better hotels provide oxygen tanks. Bolivia now finds itself in an important historical moment. Like every other Latin American country, Bolivia was colonized by Europeans. Just over a decade ago, this country elected its first indigenous president in Evo Morales, a dedicated anti-imperialist. He's expanded social welfare, refused financial aid from the World Bank and IMF, and kicked out the Drug Enforcement Agency. And he started a process in which indigenous Bolivians have gained confidence and economic relevance. 
In a way, the boom town of El Alto, the home base and economic hub of the Aymara people, is the most concrete evidence of that process. In El Alto, we see the new Bolivia emerging, and that's taking many forms. This is the city of El Alto. At an elevation of over 13,000 feet, it's the highest metropolis in the world. It's Bolivia's youngest city, incorporated less than 30 years ago. There are a million people here already, and there's more by the day. Most of that population is an indigenous Aymara population. La Paz is a colonial city. El Alto is anything but that. It's a complex place, but you could even call what they're doing here anti-colonial. And one of the ways that's happening is through its architecture. This is a story about a new architectural movement born here in El Alto. The resulting buildings are known as cholets. La ciudad de El Alto en realidad empezó siendo una ciudad dormitorio de La Paz, una ciudad de apoyo a la ciudad de La Paz. Hoy día es una ciudad tan grande como la ciudad de La Paz. Es una ciudad que tiene un centro propio que está creciendo y se ha convertido en la sede de un grupo socioeconómico nuevo, surgente en la ciudad, que se ha asentado en El Alto. El Alto's economy is booming thanks to its status as a center of commerce for everything from animals to counterfeit handbags to Japanese cars. This is Freddy Mamani, considered the father of this movement. He's worked on over 60 cholets so far. Freddy Mamani Silvestre, creador de la arquitectura andina en Bolivia. The term cholet, by the way, is a play on words combining the word chalet with the word cholo, a derogatory term for a Latin American with indigenous blood. Freddy's work draws on a combination of indigenous design elements, ancient Andean iconography, and the traditional color palette of the Bolivian high plains. We're in Tiwanaku. It's about two hours to the west of La Paz and El Alto, out on the high plain. It's the site of an ancient ruin from the Tiwanaku civilization. Freddy has told us that he gets his inspiration from two main sources. One is the Aymara culture and its colors and its textiles, and the other is the Tiwanaku culture and its shapes and its symbols. Freddy has a few of these buildings under construction at once. We've been in a few of these now. This is the largest hall by far that we've seen. You start to see that the work that they're doing is very detailed and the details are really important and that they're really deliberate. Although it might seem kind of random and wacky, especially the colors. You see here, for example, that they've planned everything out right down to the last little light fixture. Talking about the importance of detail, you have this kind of amazingly ornate gold line tiling with spoons and forks and a breakfast scene, which is admittedly pretty bizarre. We're outside one of Freddy's finished buildings now, and uh, it's a pretty huge one. Anyway, we're gonna head inside and uh, hopefully get to meet one of the owners, something we've been wondering about. Who are the people that are owning and running these buildings? What do Increíble. Esta es la idea, digamos, familiar. Es de mi madre. Entonces nosotros, sus hijos, hicimos realidad su sueño. So you feel happy with the result, with how this turned out? Yes, very happy. These buildings are a status symbol as well as a business investment, and they're not cheap to build. Though no one wants to talk price tag, we heard some figures in the $300,000 range. That's a big figure here, and it gives an idea of the kind of new wealth being created in El Alto. But these buildings aren't meant just to look impressive. They're meant to make money, often housing a number of businesses on the lower floors with an apartment for the owner at the top. A través de esta arquitectura marcamos identidad por lo siguiente, porque nosotros estamos aplicando nuestras iconografías andinas de Tiwanaku, de nuestros tejidos, incluso eh, parte de los diseños, digamos, en fachadas, en interiores. Eso significa de que yo estoy fusionando nuestra identidad a la arquitectura, donde la arquitectura pues representa nuestra identidad. Es una expresión de yo tengo capacidad económica, mi gusto va por este lado y yo hago esto porque a mí me gusta. Si no te gusta a ti es un problema tuyo, a mí sí me gusta.
In every single one of these buildings, the starting point and the centerpiece is an events hall where people can have parties. Freddie always tells us that the most important thing for these buildings is that they be alive and that they be able to generate income too. And we heard that this one behind us, the King Alexander Events Hall, is gonna be having a wedding party tonight. So we decided to stop by and see what it's like when these buildings do come alive. Cuando entras a los interiores de los locales, es un, una abundancia de barroco y de colores que te deslumbra y que te, te pone en fiesta. No puedes quedarte a, a melancólicamente sentado en un rincón y poniendo a pensar en la esencia del ser y la presencia del ser sobre la tierra. No, olvídate, el salón no te lo permite. Many architects see the work of Freddie Mamani and others here as a slap in the face to their profession. But like it or not, these architects of El Alto have accomplished a rare feat in that they're changing the face of their city. And this is not just an aesthetic movement, but a cultural one. One that for the indigenous people of Bolivia says, we're here, we're going to do things our way, because this is our land. Puerto Rico is drowning in debt. As a U.S. territory, the island nation can't file for bankruptcy. The country owes $72 billion to lenders. That's an average of $20,000 per citizen. Over 150 schools have been closed. Taxes are up. Thousands of public employees have been laid off. And according to experts, it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's no wonder there's a whole population of young people that believes the island would be better off as an independent nation. Perhaps that's why today there's a huge resurgence of punk rock music being performed across Puerto Rico. Not just men, but young women are rising up and lashing out on stage as the country spirals further and further into debt. I had to see for myself how music can speak to the rage of a nation and what will come of it. Meet the Puerto Rican punks. Some music critics say that punk rock is dead, but here in Puerto Rico, it's not just alive, it's thriving. There's this new generation of musicians who are publishing albums, opening clubs. They're completely redefining the neighborhood that they live in, bringing it back with music and art. We came here to find out why punk and why now. We have a sound of punk, of Puerto Rican punk, and people should know about it. Being a punk band in a, in a colonial island, we have a lot of things to, to be angry about and to tell the world about it, you know. When you look closer, you see the conditions here are ripe for a punk movement. Days before we arrived, thousands of people went out to protest gender equality being taught in public schools. The fact that they made a march against that very, very basic concept and it drew thousands of people, it, it just speaks for itself. Conformity has always been a part of Puerto Rican society. When there is injustice, the majority just stands there with their arms crossed and they're like, this sucks, but what can I do? When I found out that there was a punk scene here in Puerto Rico, I went instantly like, boom, that's where I want to be. Pequeña Vera of Dada Berlin is one of the latest punk acts to emerge. It can often feel um, a little bit weird seeing how male-dominated it is. As one of the only female performers, she's starting to make a name for herself, evoking the riot girl tradition. I got a chance to meet up with Pequeña Vera and to accompany her to a radio appearance. Bienvenidas y bienvenidos a otra edición más de Frecuencia Alterna. Comenzamos escuchando al grupo Dada Berlín, porque están aquí con nosotros en el estudio. Y bueno, hay bien poco canon de género, de, de problemas de género, uh -huh. y menos todavía de, con una mujer cantándolo. ¿Por qué no pasa más? A mí me parece muy extraño 
que no ha habido una movida feminista en la escena, considerando que muchas de las chicas, mayoría de las chicas que conozco en la escena, se identifican como feministas. Bueno, vamos a escuchar otra canción ahora. ¿Qué vamos a escuchar? 713. Esto está perfecto, de hecho, que fuera esa canción ahora. Sí. <risa> On the gender discussion. Exacto. Covering myself in blood, writhing, twitching, popping my eyes out, looking like a completely insane person. It's a form of saying, if I can't own my body and my sexuality, then you can't either. What Peking is doing challenges the norms on an island that's still traditional, but punk is nothing new in Puerto Rico. Las Ardillas are a mainstay of the punk scene, singing about their daily struggles on the island. What does punk rock mean here in Puerto Rico? What does punk mean to you? You know, do the thing you, know? you like, like fuck everybody, like what they like. Maybe that's the thing that we are different from the whole Puerto Rican society that we're not really... Close-minded. Yeah. And is the punk scene a more progressive scene? I mean, in terms of who it accepts and who is in, you know... For example, why do you think there aren't as many punk performers that are women? It's not an issue. But is punk open to women? <laughs> of course, yeah, totally. Kristen, do you feel the same, like this is... What they're saying, does that, is it the same for you? Or? I'm 30 and most of the guys I know consider me to be their friend because I act more like a guy than a girl. And it's more like a hidden thing. And the truth of the matter is that women are not considered equal to men here. Is it an issue in Puerto Rican society? Yes, in general, but we're a bit over that. A bit, a little bit more over the general population in Puerto Rico. That's very machista, male-centric. Dada Berlin, what do you think about Dada Berlin? <laughs> Girls that are younger than I am are moving the scene towards more of a feminist approach. They're more in control of their bodies instead of being controlled. I, I hold them to be my my role models, actually. I am very astonished by the work that they've been doing lately. Kristen Fink is also breaking the norms for women in Puerto Rico. She's joined up with Jose Javier Rodriguez, the band's guitarist, and two others to open up an indie music venue called Club 77. Are you ready for this? I'm ready for this. Club 77 has become the epicenter for the punk scene. Kristen takes me to the club for a big concert celebrating its year anniversary. It's been great, and uh, we're celebrating the people, the bands, and the scene here in Puerto Rico. Are you expecting a lot of people to come tonight? Uh, we're expecting a packed house. Majority of the bands are all men, but when you find yourself with other female punks and you just make a group, it feels great. I feel that I'm contributing to a change because I'm actually being vocal about these issues, making it be heard and make people talk. Personally, I, I would love to see people thinking that they have the power to change the situation. Gracias. <laughs>